As a proud and grateful alumnus of the College of Law at the University of Kentucky, I want to begin by thanking the College of Law and the Kentucky Law Journal for conceptualizing, organizing, and hosting this wonderful, wonderful symposium. When Dean Brennan, my new friend, and Stefan Bing, a friend that I had, yet, had not yet met, called me uh, early this year and announced to me, to my surprise, that the Law Journal had decided to hold a symposium in my honor. I was stunned, really. It was nothing that I could have imagined would come my way. And then when they told me in the same conversation that it was my choice to, to, to select the subject of this symposium, they will recall that there was no hesitation in my voice whatsoever. I immediately responded, we need to address the crisis under funding of the state courts in this country. And, and they immediately took up the challenge, immediately recognized the opportunity, and went to work in a way that, that I have been impressed since then with their level of intellectual competency, their commitment, which has been nothing but professional every step of the way, and a great credit not only to our wonderful law school, but to this university and to our profession. Uh, I'm one of those older lawyers that sees a bright future for the law because I see bright lawyers coming into the law from our law schools, beginning with the College of Law at the University of Kentucky. And I'm convinced that we have a lot about which to be optimistic. I then, faced with the challenge that I shared with them from that phone call on, called upon some folks that I have had a great respect for for a long time, uh, beginning with Mary McQueen, the president of the National Center for State Courts, who knows more about state courts cumulatively than any single person I know walking around in this country. With her Kentucky roots, I thought she might have a little bit of interest in helping us, but I had no idea, no idea that Mary and the National Center would step up to the way, to the level of the commitment that they have demonstrated to this project. Mark Martin is someone that I've had the pleasure of working with um, on the judicial division side of the American Bar Association. I've been an admirer of his for a long time, and, and he is indefatigable when it comes to his commitment to our profession, our great association, and, and he took to this project like a duck to water. And, uh, and then I called my longtime friend, the general counsel of LexisNexis, and I, I asked Ken Thompson, Ken, can you put up with me one more time because I've got one more ask and I know you're the person, you're the company that I can count on. And again, in the same conversation without hesitation, he and LexisNexis stepped up and for that I'm, I'm forever grateful. And then of course I looked at, to my friends at the American Bar Association and I was going to say this till later in, in my comments, but I want to say it at the outset. I talked to Steve and I, and I talked to Laurel Bellows, uh, Steve Zach and Laurel Bellows earlier today. They were so kind to take time from their schedules to come and be at this program. And we have in the leadership of the ABA right now, a continuity of commitment a continuity of leadership, which I am convinced is very much in the best interests of our profession and certainly of the American Bar Association. Uh, under Steve's dynamic leadership, and I mean dynamic leadership last year, we started off with the task force on the preservation of the justice system. His idea, his genius, the right idea at the right time. And one thing that I learned at the College of Law that I've never forgotten is that it's amazing what we can accomplish when we don't worry about who gets the credit. When there's a need, when there's an opportunity, when there's a cause that must be served, we all come together and we don't quit working on it until we've accomplished what's needed to be accomplished. And we all know that on this issue, 
we're a long way from accomplishing that at this point in time. And so I'm pleased to tell you uh, this evening that not only have I taken up the baton from Steve to carry forward the commitment of the American Bar Association, but Laurel Bellows has assured me and authorized me to speak on her behalf in this regard. She is committed this coming year to continue the task force on the preservation of the courts, and, I, and I, we owe her a great debt of gratitude in that regard. I haven't had a chance to talk to Jim Silkenet yet, but I have a strong, and his head, nodding head tells me that uh, Jim, who is always there uh, when there's a need in the profession, that we're going to continue this. What, I, what I'm really trying to say to, to everyone here this evening is that, and I'll say the same thing that was said to me when I, when I, when I made this so public commitment about where we were going to and are focusing our resources for the most part as an association in this country uh, this year, a number of people said to me, why would you tackle something like that? You can't, you can't get this done, in quotes, your year as ABA president. And I responded, you know, this isn't about me. This isn't about the American Bar Association. This is about constitutional democracy in this country. And the goal here, thank you, thank you. The goal here is not to solve the problem this year. The goal is to change the direction. The goal is to turn this situation around so that we awaken the American people to realize that what's at stake here is their constitutional democracy, their constitutional freedom. And we'll probably be working on that for the rest of our lives. I'm, I'm confident that we will. Uh, but it's worth working on because it's heart and soul of who we are as an American people. I'd like to read to you a few words and I quote, all courts shall be open and every person for an injury done him in his lands, goods, person or reputation shall have a remedy by due course of law and right and justice administered without sale, denial, or delay. Those words are from the Kentucky Constitution. There is no argument more clear or cogent as to why our courts require adequate funding. To fulfill their constitutional responsibilities, courts need to be sheltered from budget storms and downturns. To properly fulfill their respective responsibilities, legislators need to preserve the right to legal action when needed as enumerated in our state constitutions. This crucial role played by our courts in protecting individuals and groups cannot be overstated. Justice Black, in writing for the majority in Chambers versus State of Florida, expressed in a few lines of that opinion a resonating argument for why anyone who has ever felt discriminated against or ever empathized with those who have should respect, appreciate, and treasure our courts and what they mean to our unique constitutional democracy. Judge Black wrote, and I quote, under our constitutional system, Courts stand against any winds that blow as, heavens of as havens of refuge for those who might otherwise suffer because they are helpless, weak, outnumbered, or because they are non-conforming victims of prejudice and public excitement. No higher duty, no more solemn responsibility rests upon this court than that of translating into living law and maintaining this constitutional shield deliberately planned and inscribed for the benefit of every human being subject to our constitution of whatever race, creed, or persuasion." Close quote. I came prepared this evening with lots of statistics 
And the statistics are powerful. When I travel around the country now and I speak to non-lawyer community groups, the public is, is really stunned. They sit back in their chairs. They can't believe that, believe that this has happened in America. They, they, they can't understand why no court in this country is funded with more than 3.5 percent, excuse me, 3.5 percent of the overall state operating budget. The great state of Georgia, 0.78 percent of its operating budget goes to the courts, and that includes the funding for the entire prosecutorial system. $178 million in cuts this spring, 500 people almost immediately lose their jobs in, in the in the court system. Judges haven't had a raise in 12 years. Judges are, are, are resigning at a record rate. We heard today, California, in the last 18 months, $350 million in cuts. I mean, this is, this is unthinkable, but it's happening here in this country. Steve Zach said in his eloquent words as part of his panel participation today, he quoted Sandra Day O'Connor who said, People must have a safe place. People need their courts. And we know that when people need their courts, they don't need them later, they need them now. Or the relief that they're seeking ends up being meaningless and ineffective. That courtroom must be open to protect families. That courtroom must be open to validate and protect contracts for business including small business, which is the backbone of this country. That courtroom must be open to keep the wheels of justice turning. That courtroom must be open to defend our individual rights to prove again and again that we continue to be a free society. In closing, I want to share with you a thought that some of us along the way may have forgotten at times but those of us who are to be lawyers in this room may not have yet come to fully appreciate, but, it, but it's something I want us all to refresh in our thinking and take up as our banner of motivation. And that is that we are officers of the court. To whatever title any of us may ascend or be fortunate enough uh, to have in our career success, whatever it might be, there is nothing more significant, more meaningful, more sacred for us as lawyers and judges than being an officer of the court. And that brings with it privileges, of course, but it also brings with it responsibilities. And I respectfully submit to all of us this evening that there's, more, there's no more significant responsibility for us as officers of the court than standing up for our courts, speaking up for our courts, going out together to awaken the American public to understand that these courts, their courts, are the key to constitutional democracy. Because otherwise, no courts, no justice, no freedom. Thank you all very much.